Hello everyone, Hyper here and welcome to the Big Dumb Strats video for Mythic Queen's Court. In this video, we'll be breaking down the fight going from general strategy to DPS, healing and tank roles, as well as adding a new segment to the end that we felt was kind of unique and we should be adding it for this particular fight, where our raid leader actually walks you through the entire fight and what it will look like. Once again, I'm joined by Lozi, the GM of BDG, to talk about tanking and Shampi, healing officer of BDG, disc priest expert, and solo healer of Mythic Argus to cover the healing. Hopefully this video helps you guys out and if you have any feedback, please make sure to leave it in the comment section below and we'll try to implement it in our future videos. That being said, let's get started. As always, the first session of this video is a general strategy breakdown. For Queen's Court, you're going to want to bring two tanks, four healers, and an assortment of DPS. Range multi daughters are preferred here, um, mainly due to the bosses being spread all the time. This is one of the few fights in WoW that is 100% scripted. Abilities will act the same pull to pull. Because of this, as a raid leader, you can proactively raid lead this fight rather than reactively uh, by constantly telling your raiders what mechanic to deal with and what mechanic is coming up. For example, saying something like, charge into eruption or during the eruption talking about how you're going to have to move up for form ranks after it or calling out spark order as far in advance you can always in essence stay ahead of this fight the mythic mechanic on this fight is called sphere of influence about half of the room is always unusable this rotates clockwise with each set of decrees this gives the raid less room to handle mechanics that the bosses throw at you and adds a significant amount of movement overall just like on Heroic, in Mythic you will have to deal with the sparks that spawn. So the overall strategy for killing these is to always kill the one that's closest to the raid because your melee DPS are able to kind of help out with that and they're also going to be getting cleaved from the bosses. Um, while you're doing this, you want to start multi-dotting and cleaving onto the second spark. Now choosing the second spark is kind of up to your raid, we can show you what we chose to do and why. But typically, just choose a second spark and just stick to it uh, pull to pull. And then the third spark, you just want to leave it uh, ignored, don't dot it, and it will just time out on its own. As far as pacing goes for how fast you want to be killing these, basically just kill the first one as quickly as you can, um, and then give your raid a little bit of time to recover, then kill the second one, and then, like I said before, the third one will just time out on its own. The next major mechanic that you will have to deal with is Frantic Charge. So for soaking these, you should assign your mobile ranged and tanky ranged players, mages, warlocks, uh, things along those lines, and if you have more rogues, then they can help out as well. You should have about 4 players assigned to help with these soaks. So the person who is targeted should always place their charge between the two bosses along the edges of the room. This will just make it easier for everyone to get in there and help them soak the mechanic. One thing to point out is that the charge target will get knocked back based on where their back is facing. So whenever you get charged, if you face towards the edges of the room, you will get knocked towards the center. And then everyone else just gets knocked back relative to the position of the person who is targeted. Classes with immunities or strong personal cooldowns can also solo these if needed, and throughout the fight, there will be some mechanic overlaps where you will definitely want to take advantage of this. And we'll talk about this during the walkthrough. If you are soaking and you are targeted by the Fanatical Verdict, which is the debuff that makes you spread out and then it does a little explosion, then make sure to be as far out as possible since the range of the Verdict is smaller than the soak zone. So you're still able to help out even when you have this debuff. For the last part of the strategy, we'll talk about decrees. We're going to assume you know what each decree does, but we'll just give some brief tips about how to handle each of them. The first thing to know about decrees is that they happen in the exact same order every pull, and they last exactly 30 seconds apiece. So the first decree is form ranks. Uh, it happens at 30 seconds into the fight, and you want to just get into a circle as quickly as you can. And if you see an empty circle, jump into those. Uh, if you get into a circle, plant, and the people who are getting into circles after you try and fill around you. You should aim to have melee get to the circles that are closest to the boss and range take the ones furthest from the boss. The second decree is repeat performance. And something to note about that is that several abilities like interrupts 
Racial abilities, Demon Hunter Double Jump can be pressed to uh, act as a buffer between abilities to avoid getting silenced. The third decree is standalone. There's not a lot to say about this decree, but there will be two charges that happen during this decree. And you should aim to solo those charges. If it goes on a class that doesn't have a strong defensive like an immunity or a large DR, you can use a healing external on that target and just stay spread throughout the entire decree. So the fourth decree is Deferred Sentence, and the main tip that we have for Deferred Sentence is to try to consistently drop your stacks at around three stacks, but be careful about spark overlaps. If a spark dies around the time that you remove your stacks, it can be very fatal. Stacks can be reset by jumping and won't reset if you just slowly stutter step. You have to move a relevant distance. You can also use an immunity like a Paladin Bubble or a Mage Block to completely remove that buff, and you won't accrue stacks for the rest of the decree. So the final decree is Obey or Suffer. The main thing about that decree is you just need to be careful about sparks and other mechanics overlapping during that decree. After the debuff drops, you have five seconds between when it dropped and when it can be applied to you next. Absorbs will still function on this decree, and any damage that is absorbed won't trigger the five second unhealable period. In other words, you won't get the debuff. Next, for the damage portion of this fight. Your general DPS strategy will vary depending on the raid comp you end up using. If your raid has multiple execute classes like Shadow Priest or Mages, then your entire raid should be aiming to DPS Silvas until 30%, and once Silvas reaches 30%, everyone will swap over to Pashmar, including your melee DPS. Now this will give your execute classes a nice little damage boost, However, this strategy might not be ideal if you're kind of uh, heavy on the melee side. If you have more melee in your group, then I definitely recommend having your melee DPSing Silvaz because they're able to keep 100% uptime on him since all his mechanics include stacking on top of the boss, while your ranged DPS should be favoring Pashmar because Pashmar's mechanics include uh, moving away from the boss and your ranged DPS will always just kind of linger out of range and not have to deal with them. A few pointers for ranged DPS on this fight, you should always try to position between the two bosses, favoring the edges of the room rather than the center. This will make it easier to multi-dot both targets, or if you need to be casting abilities into both, like a fire mage once you get to execute, it will make it so you don't have to turn your camera. Also, if you're between the two bosses and constantly rotating with them, it means that you will never be cut off by the melee, whenever one of the circles or decrees actually changes which portion of the room it covers. One very niche tip I can give you that is related to Demon Hunters and Shadow Priests, so if your raid has them then you might consider doing this, is that before you do your actual pull, just go ahead and pull Silvaz to right where the room entrance is, where the wall goes up, so you can reset him at any time. But let your Demon Hunter get his I-beam, then meta, then I-beam combo off, and this will ensure that he has maximum meta uptime, and during this time, your Shadow Priest will also be building insanity on the boss. And then once your Demon Hunter does his combo, you can go ahead and reset the boss and do a 20 second pull timer, and this will coincide with the boss respawn, so your Demon Hunter will start the fight with an extra meta, and your Shadow Priest will go into the fight with full insanity. DPS cooldown timings on this fight are super straightforward. You just want to pop everything on pull, and then you want to use your cooldowns as often as possible. However, there are a few things that you should be keeping in mind every time you're preparing to use your cooldowns. For example, if you're using a trinket like Font, and a mechanic is about to come out that requires you to move, then you want to make sure that you're delaying that until after the mechanic. So for example, if a charge is about to come out, and you're assigned to be soaking those charges, uh, avoid starting to channel your font right before the charge and then having to interrupt it to help with the soak. Regardless of if you're playing melee or ranged on this fight, your goal should be the same, and that is to keep as much uptime on these bosses as possible. You always want to be DPSing something. With a heavy movement fight like Queen's Court, where you're constantly moving or constantly dealing with mechanics, if you start losing track of what's happening, it can affect your DPS quite a bit, so make sure you always know what's coming up so you can plan for it in advance. Uh, we keep mentioning this over and over, this fight is 100% scripted. 
so you can know exactly where to be at what points during this fight. And if you have that planned out ahead of time, that will increase your DPS quite a bit. And now for the healing section. So first things first, for healing comp, you want to bring four healers to this fight. And while you can make any comp work reasonably, the most valuable trait in a healer is that they do large amounts of damage due to the DPS check. And frequent cooldowns are really helpful as well, which makes Disc Priests and Holy Pallies the best. Uh, in terms of damage taken, the vast majority of the damage that you take on this fight is going to come from Potent Sparks, Form Ranks, and Deferred Sends. And the most dangerous timings in the fight are when Sparks overlap with either of those Decree mechanics. Uh, potent Sparks spawn exactly every 90 seconds, and the Decrees take 2 minutes and 30 seconds to cycle. So the first set of Sparks happens at 30 seconds into the fight, as well as the first Decree, which is Form Ranks. So you have an overlap where the first spark of the first set is expiring at the same time that you have form ranks going off. So there's a lot of large AoE damage happening on the raid at that time. So you should aim to have heavy throughput and heavy DR for that set. Um, at least the first spark and the second spark and throughout the entirety of the form ranks. The second set of sparks overlaps with deferred sends, which is the last exceptionally dangerous timing of the fight. And the important thing for that is that you use enough cooldowns to get through the form rank and spark set whilst having enough to carry you through this second spark set during deferred sends. I would recommend using cooldowns like barrier, darkness, and link for that deferred sentence and spark set and cooldowns like aura mastery, shout, and strong throughput cooldowns for that first form rank and spark set. You'll probably have a lot of deaths to the deferred sentence and spark overlap, but one way to combat that is heavy throughput cooldowns and DR, and also just be vocal to your DPS about when sparks are dying so that they know not to move before, during, or after that happens, and stand still when sparks are about to die, and then move between periods where sparks are dying so that you can heal them up and they drop their stacks. In terms of healing, really the only other big consideration for in terms of decrees is obey or suffer, which blocks incoming healing when someone takes damage. This can be exceptionally dangerous when it happens to tanks because you can't heal them and they're just ticking down. So you should make sure to spam healing into them during the windows between when they have that debuff and also know that shields work on them even while they have it. So you can have your disc priests as well as shadow priests throwing their shields onto the tanks during those times and also use whatever externals you have available on the tanks. Tanking on this fight doesn't have too many weird caveats. You can pretty much follow the same set of rules the entire time. For positioning, Pashmar leads Silavaz around the room at all times, keeping the 21-yard separation. Generally, we keep them further than this, mostly due to dealing with other mechanics, such as pulling the bosses next to Sparks on pull. Tank swaps are simply done during charges. This allows the tank swapping the Silavaz to assist with soaking the charge. And also, Silavaz is immobile during this, so it just makes the swap easier. While you are tanking Silavaz, since you'll be near the back of the raid, be sure not to hug the previous Sphere of Influence, since when the decrees change, the next zone may overlap you. When tanking Pashmar, always keep an eye on her energy, and make sure to pull her out around 95 energy just to give your room raid for her violent outburst. In terms of using personal cooldowns, your highest damage and tank points of the fight are going to be 1 during Deferred Sentence. Since healers are going to be focused on healing the rest of the raid at this time, you probably won't be getting as much attention, plus you're taking damage from it as well. And 2, when you're standing outside of the Zealous Eruption, each tank is going to have to do this twice, so just make sure you have a cooldown or an available external there. So on the pull, not much is going to happen here, just makes it a good time for Lust in addition to this being a DPS check fight. More damage up front is more damage overall. The first thing the raid is going to have to deal with is Sparks. That'll spawn right around now. These Sparks are just going to be the one in melee of Silavaz and then the one in melee of Pashmar. The general rule here is the, the first one to die is always in melee of whatever target you're hitting. The first thing is we have soaks and a charge at the same time. If it's long like that, you should be able to get both soaks again. 
After this second round of soaks, range need to turn and kill the second spark, which is over by Pashmar. This is just to desync the damage. During this third set of soaks, Silva starts his eruption. The entire raid needs to be in this bubble and be mindful of the decree that will change. Anyone caught in it will take some damage. After this eruption, the raid moves up and gets ready to soak another charge. Other than that, not much is going on during repeat performance. With about 10 seconds left here, you want to start thinking about spreading out. Um, ideally, everybody claims an area and doesn't move the entire time. Keep in mind that you can have Silavaz's tank basically be right under him, and that'll conserve a little bit of area in melee. Pashmire's energy is getting high here. She'll get pulled out. This next charge is one of the two charges that are not soaked, that are just external through. When this charge comes out, Pashmar will also start casting potent sparks. So this charge shouldn't take anyone's time, but everyone can start switching to this first spark, which is in melee of Pashmar after the decrees move. Ends up being in melee of Silovaz here. The raid also kind of wants to move up here as this is a high damage portion. After this first spark dies, ranged turn around and kill the one behind them. The earlier this spark dies, the better. This is because if the spark dies later, there's a chance people aren't topped off before this obey or suffer phase. First mechanic that happens during this phase is charge. So the charge goes out. And then Silvaz will immediately do an eruption after this. So when everyone runs in this bubble, just be mindful to not stand under his feet as there is a void zone there. To be on check for the enrage, right about now you should be hitting your 30% threshold and swapping all your damage to Pashmar. After that eruption ends, the entire raid needs to move up and get in position for soaks. This is somewhere you can be ahead of time. So three more rounds of form ranks. The unique caveat to this one is that during the second one, a charge will happen, uh, but you can time it out in a way where you soak after that second one goes off, then you soak the charge, and you can get back in position for the third set of form ranks. Pashmar will do a violent outburst here, so she needs to be pulled out, and afterwards she will cast potent sparks, first spark to die. Is the one in melee range of her. And then after this dies, ranged get on the second one. It's also worth noting that in times like this, you can just constantly remind the raid to like keep moving up. So there's another charge here. This one is soaked. There's a standalone immediately after it. Everyone needs to be pre-spread. During the standalone, again, the entire raid just needs to be constantly moving up to give room for people in the back. The tank that has Silvaz needs to somehow meander his way through people. There is another eruption that happens, and you want it to be relatively close to Pashmar, just in the middle of your raid so that people don't have to move too far. This eruption is the tricky one. Um, it's during standalone, so you kind of have to run in as far as you can while not cleaving, just to leave room for people in the back. It'll fade about halfway through, but getting three or four of those ticks off on some people can be fatal. Or immediately after, there's a charge. Since a lot of damage just went out, that can also be a scary charge. It's not immune, but be aware that if you are soaking with less than max health, the proper personal there. Decrees will change again, and we'll start on this set of sparks again, starting with the one in melee. Pashmar also does another yell here, needs to be pulled out. After the first spark dies, there will be another spark and a charge roughly at the same time. Range should be working on the spark, and whoever is assigned should soak that charge. Afterwards, you move up, be in position for form ranks.
After this third form rank's finished, there's going to be a, another charge into an eruption. This one's not as fast as the last one. Silvaz will actually move after it, but the entire, most of your raid is going to have to turn around and run towards him here. Since this is a farm kill for us, the damage is a little bit different. If you are an enraged kill, there is a set of sparks that Pashmar is going to cast soon that you need to deal with. You just deal with them in the same way. These spawn off the marks for whatever reason, but kill the first one in melee of her, and then move on to your second one. Here we just ignore them because we know that the bosses are going to die before they get off. And that's a, that's a call you have to make when you can see your DPS. Generally, shortly after you kill the second one, the enrage is about to happen, and you just you really need to call a target to kill and try to kite the other one out. You can actually buy yourself a fair amount of time after the enrage by doing that up to 25 to 30 seconds. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope this guide helped you. And if you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comment section below. Or if you want to have a more in-depth conversation, you can also join my Discord, which is linked in the description box. Again, a shout out to Shampi and Lozi for helping out. And if you want to check out their Twitch or Twitter, they are linked in the description box of this video. See you guys in the next one.